Uh, Joe is asked us to talk into these microphones, even though I can practically reach out and touch you. Um, <laughs> the reason is not because we think that you're hearing impaired, but he's apparently trying to record this, and it doesn't work from back there unless we talk into the microphone. So that's why we're doing this, uh, not to be unnecessarily formal. I'm just going to go through what we did in this auditorium a few days ago uh, as part of the town meeting for the college um, for everybody in the, on campus and uh, just the parts of it that don't involve the financial presentation and the academic affairs, which you'll hear from the people who actually do that stuff. So first of all, you might wonder um, what's happening to the college's ability to attract people like you? These are the characteristics of the class of 2017 that just arrived. We think they're a pretty good group, actually. Now, Charlie, every time, says, you're the very best class we've ever had. Um, they'll never be the same as the class of 2008. We realize that. But these are pretty good kids, OK? And the diversity is there. Um, the academic achievement is there. Uh, they're really very bright uh, kids. No, they didn't take the same kind of risk that you did. Um, but um, they're really an amazing group. You'll be proud to meet them. I remember in an alumni meeting with Tom in San Francisco a few years ago, uh, talking to some members of the class of 2006 who had been out a while and not really had a chance to meet many of the new students. And they were worried that, you know, the next class is not going to be as good as we were. And when they had a chance to meet some of these students, they were amazed. They thought, well, only because the college is brand new and you know, it didn't have any buildings yet, that class of 06 was tough and we're special and nobody will be like us. And we've got one sitting here in the row with a big grin on his face, so I know <laughs> that's how he feels. Um, but they were really pleased to see that uh, the students are really um, the seamless in terms of their ability to do their um, enthusiasm, and their interest in engineering. So there they are. Uh, what happened to the group that graduated last May? Well, it's only been a few months, OK? But 91% uh, already know what they're doing. Um, there's a few that are still thinking about what they're doing. Uh, they haven't made a mind up on a particular job, or they're traveling, or they're still looking. Um, there's a number going to graduate school. This isn't actually representative of what I think the number will be five years from now. But as they first leave uh, the college, there is a tendency for Olin students to want to be an engineer. And I don't think that's a bad thing. Okay, But as time goes on, they find that they can do even more things if they had a few more uh, credentials to their name. The starting salaries are interesting, too. Um, this can be a problem for us, actually. Because as the salaries get higher and higher, they begin to uh, creep into the range where we have faculty salaries. And I hear some complaints from faculty that maybe they should just be a bachelor's student at Olin again. <laughs> um, they would actually do well. Um, we don't emphasize the salary data very much at Olin because it's not uniformly distributed across all companies, as I'm sure you know. That's an average. So there's some that are a lot higher than that, and there's some that aren't. Um, so making a positive difference in the world is what uh, young people are really interested in doing. Uh, but there are a couple of companies, particularly on the you know, different time zone from here, that tend to have quite an impact on these starting salaries. And we don't quite know what to do about that. Uh, so achievements. Uh, one, of the th one of the things that's happened since the last town meeting, which was in um, February, I believe, of this year, is that Olin has graduated a lot of students who have this special designation that they're a National Academy of Engineering Grand Challenge Scholar. That didn't exist when you were here in 2008. And basically what this is, the National Academy of Engineering created this list of 14 major challenges of the 21st century, and they can find them on their website. They sort of group into four areas dealing with sustainability, and um, you know, security, health, and increasing the quality of life from generation to generation. That's sort of what they look like. They're big things. And um, in order to try to interest the next generation in aiming at those big problems, the National Academy uh, developed a, a set of 
certificates to recognize graduates who've gone beyond just getting a bachelor's degree in engineering, but doing something special that includes these five additional characteristics of your education, which you can choose. They have to do with doing a project on one of those grand challenges. Doing something entrepreneurial, doing something abroad, doing something with interdisciplinary work with people in another college, for example, and doing service learning. So if you do those five things and you graduate, the National Academy will recognize you. In fact, they put your name on their website. Now, last year, there were a group of universities, um, nine schools, that graduated students with this designation. And nationally, altogether, there were a total of 58 Grand Challenge Scholars. Well, guess what? 24 of them graduated from Olin. Uh, we're the smallest school on the list. So we thought that was an unusual characteristic. Olin students are really aimed at the grand challenges when they leave here. And I think you were too. We just didn't have that kind of recognition when you were here in 2008. Um, it's ranking season. Every college president takes a deep breath before you say that. Um, not really our favorite time of the year. Uh, however, US News uh, has treated us well yet again. I'm sure you've noticed that. Olin jumped up. Uh, two places. See, two years ago we were number eight. Last year we were number six. This year we're number four. I wonder what will be next year. Um, the, we are right now just below West Point and tied with the Naval Academy and the Air Force Academy in this particular list. So it's good company. I mean, they're not quite as good as we are, but, but we still like being where we are. Uh, there's this other set of rankings, the Princeton Review, which has a lot of individual categories. In fact, they have 60 or so different uh, categories, and they identify the top 20 schools across the entire country. And this is not about engineering. Of course, this is about all higher education institutions. And there are a couple of interesting things. Olin ranks number two in the U.S. for students study the most. So I think you should be a little bit comfortable that the classes that are coming after you are still working hard, okay? They're not just goofing off. Um, and you can see what else they're doing. They're <laughs> that goes with the uh, students work hard, okay? There, is an, there are lots of other rankings. One of them that we didn't bother to put up here is put out by something like business innovation uh, company and what it basically does is it it takes these individual categories from Princeton Review and it combines them with some formula that they came up with to decide these are the best and it lists the top 20 I think um, campuses in America that's the idea and Olin turns out to be number six on that list because we do quite well on these lists and these are the ingredients so if you're not on that this thing there's no way you're going to be in the top and the other. So at any rate, rankings are important though because Olin still isn't a household word. How do people find out what Olin is? What do they think of it when they hear about it? It's you know, the media just has an impact. I'm sure you understand that. Um, recently, Olin students have become interested in sailing, particularly robotic sailing in the ocean with a machine that's autonomous, that doesn't have a joystick. Um, a lot of the impetus for this came from Drew Bennett. And Drew is, has been the director of SCOPE for the last number of years. He's, he's just handing the baton over to Alicia Semensky this year for being the head of SCOPE. And I'm stealing a little bit of the thunder from Vin. But um, Drew has been a real leader in this. This year, the Olin boat finished number four in the country. And we hosted the competition internationally at Gloucester Harbor. And the size of the competition about doubled, and we added a high school division. So this robotics thing in the ocean is growing, and Olin has a disproportionate role in it, which I think is quite interesting. Um, scope is alive and well, and I thought you'd be interested to see some of the statistics of what happened in this year's scope um, in the spring. There were 120 presentations. One interesting thing this year is this JavaScript Zeros to Web Development Heroes. It's a course during SCOPE that's taught by students about um, software development. 
and it was quite successful, and we think that's a new dimension that's worth uh, mentioning. Alumni update. So you guys know more about this than I do, uh, so I'll just point to one or two things. I'm sure you are aware of this, but a member of the class of 07, uh, Nate Smith, was identified among this elite group by Forbes magazine. So that's something you can be proud of when you're talking to your, your uh, classmates and your co-employees, wherever you are. And Stephen Jang in the class of 12, who um, got a Fulbright Award and went to China to study environmentalism, came back from that and wrote an article about it, which The Atlantic magazine uh, published. So who says engineers can't write? Okay, at least Olin engineers. Um, development, family, and alumni relations. So this has been an increasing part of what we do at Olin since 2008, because in 2008 we had this big financial crisis. So we've made a lot of changes in the way we operate the school, and you'll hear about that uh, from Steve in a minute. Um, the main thrust of our development effort is what we're calling the revolution in engineering education. I need to think about why we're doing this. It doesn't mean that we are not um, as committed or more committed to the quality of undergraduate education on our campus as we've always been. This is a little bit like a teaching hospital, okay? We have patients. We care about our patients. You can't provide world-class health care unless you're also involved in moving the the uh, frontiers of knowledge in what causes diseases and how you cure them. So you're teaching people to become physicians at the same time that you're healing people. That's what Olin is doing in education. Now, if you're going to try and raise money for a school like Olin to help replace the income that was lost when the financial crisis took a big bite out of our endowment, who's going to pay? Okay, I think the Olin community is already invested. You, your folks. Um, you know, participation rate is the highest in the country. We, we can't ask more from you in terms of being committed to the school. But Olin is not a very large place. If we're going to increase the actual funding, we're going to have to find people who graduated from somewhere else. So that means the reason they're giving to Olin is not because, you know, pound on our chest, we're Olin. It's because Olin is a cause Olin stands for something important that they believe in. And by giving to Olin, through us, they can impact that cause. The cause for us is a revolution in engineering education, okay? It's not done well at lots of places. There is a 50% dropout rate in engineering nationally. Only 4.5% of the BS degrees offered nationally last year went to students who majored in engineering of any kind at any university. It's a dropping market share. Um, people just aren't interested in the way it's being taught. We think you can do something about that. That's our mission. Um, so the long-term fundraising efforts here are focused on these four primary uh, activities. First and foremost is to increase the capacity of Olin to make this kind of an impact. Increasing capacity means increasing faculty. So our goal really is to increase the faculty size by about 25% over the next five years without increasing the student size at all, okay? That'll provide more resources for our on-campus community too. A richer array of courses to take from faculty with different backgrounds. And these additional faculty will be involved with part of their time in helping other institutions to improve their educational quality. So that's the, the big vision. And you can see this will foster innovation in the curriculum It'll assure the availability of state-of-the-art technology and facilities. We need folks. You know, this entire campus was built and occupied for the first time in the fall of 2002. All the buildings were brand new. This fall, they're 11 years old. There's going to be a day on which all of the roofs leak at the same time because they were built at the same time. Who's going to pay to, um, to fix that? So we need to begin to develop literally a rainy day fund in order to help pay for that, and that's what this campaign is about. Um, and also to ensure Olin's ability to continue attracting the right kinds of students through scholarships. So Olin is still, still provides one of the best financial aid opportunities in the country. Um, we're need-blind in admission. 
We have full need-based aid for every student that comes with grants, not with loans. Almost no colleges do that anymore. In addition to that, um, Olin also has 50% merit scholarship on top of it. That takes a big bite out of our budget in order to provide that financial aid. I believe the financial aid, since you were here, uh, and we've moved into this new era where all families are struggling, and Olin now expects uh, some tuition to be paid, financial aid budget has increased over fivefold. Uh, so that's a much larger part. And we need support in order to help pay for the need-based part of that aid. That's what we're looking for. You probably remember I just wrote something about this not very long ago, so I don't need to pound on this for very much. Um, interesting, now that we're about to launch this big effort to raise money, our Vice President for Development, Tom Krimmel, has decided that his grandchildren are more attractive than Olin. And I don't know how to compete with that. Uh, and so he's announced at the end of this calendar year, he's going to move, probably back to Wisconsin, which is where most of his grandchildren live now. Uh, Tom has been terrific, um, and we have a search for his successor that's already launched. We have a committee, we have a search firm, we have a schedule, position description, all that sort of thing. It's underway. We hope by early in the spring we'll have another su successor in place and begin rebuilding and strengthening our development team. Now, this is what Tom's legacy is at Olin. You see, he came in in 2008, right over there. It was the fall of 2008 when the financial crisis hit. And all of us were sitting here pacing back and forth, con contemplating jumping off a bridge. You know, what do we do now? Because Olin's financial model was built on almost all of our operating expense coming from the investment returns on our endowment. But our endowment had dropped by about 40%, and there weren't any returns. Okay? Nobody was making money um, by having it invested. Uh, you were hoping to put it under a mattress or something so it didn't just keep evaporating. What do we do? Tom says there's opportunity here. In fact, that's the best opportunity when things are not good because now you have real need, and people respond to need. And they did. And so every year, I mean, the first year he had an increase of 75% in the amount of giving to the college during the crisis. By the way, nationally, the uh, fundraising, per the percentage of giving nationally to higher education um, went down. Uh, in fact, it was negative. It was like 10 or 15 percent below what it had been the year before. Olin's went up 75 percent. And then it's gone up 35 percent, 23 percent, 31 percent, and so forth ever since. Uh, so he's leaving us with some momentum and a significant total amount of fun funding, uh, 2.29 million. Yes? You know, I don't, <laughs> alumni donations is not a large part of this, uh, and that's one of the reasons why we are targeting funding from people who, ha who care about the causes that we are committed to. Um, marketing and communications. We didn't have a marketing and communications office when you were here in 2008. We do now. You just met Michelle a few minutes ago. She has a team now that's working with her, as you know. Uh, they've already made a difference in what Olin looks like, as you can see. And this is in part to send a signal uh, outside of our campus that Olin is entering decade two. We're taking a deep breath with a much larger goal, and we're going to compete with the big boys for uh, making an impact. Um, there's a website development that's underway. You'll see more about this. It's coming really uh, in a few months, early 2014. And there's a committee that's involved in it. 54 alumni were involved in this program, as you can see. Now, we just talked about NPR. Um, the NPR sound clips that have to do with Olin were initiated at first by this gentleman, um, Howard Stevenson. Howard is a member of our Board of Trustees. Uh, Howard. Uh, was a faculty member at Harvard Business School for decades. He was in charge of Harvard Publishing, the, and he was also a vice president for development there. He's raised over $500 million, I think he said, at one point. Um, he's written a number of books on fundraising. He and his wife, uh, Freddie, have become really committed to Olin. I think, if I remember correctly, Freddie is the chairman of the board at 
Is it WBUR? Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's right. So they're very well known in the, in the national public radio community. So when you have Howard Stevenson stepping up and saying, we care about Olin. Uh, we're going to make a gift in honor of what Olin is trying to do in education. This causes people to um, respond. In fact, I had a, I was just telling Vin, had a phone conversation recently with a professor, Michael Louie, at the University of Illinois. He's the editor of the Journal for Engineering Education. We had some business to talk about. Hadn't talked with him for a while. And the first thing he said was, wow, I heard that Olin College is doing something about education on a national level on NPR. Of course, Olin's been working with Illinois for quite a while, so he knew about our work with them, but he didn't know that we had made this commitment to do things at a bigger level. So that's one of the audiences that this is hitting. Um, that's about all that I want to say. We've already thanked Chrissy and the team, but we can't thank people enough. So I'd like to uh, thank them again. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Steve. You don't mind, I'm going to stand back here so I can see what I'm talking about. Um, you've probably noticed that some things have changed since you've been gone, some of the things are the same. Uh, one of the things I'm still having trouble getting used to is not seeing blue and silver balloons here um, with our new color palette. I, I found myself feel, feeling sorry for our balloon guy who has been delivering balloons to the campus since day one, and I just have this vision of him having cartons of blue and silver balloons in his basement wondering what he's going to do with them. <laughs> but we have, we have colors now. Um, I'm going to try to go through a, a fairly high level uh, overview of the college's finances, um, touching on, on these topics, uh, what has happened and what the impact of it has been. Um, as Rick implied, the college really took a hit in the, the financial crisis. It was pretty serious, uh, but we've managed to get to a new position where we are financially sustainable. Um, but, you know, the, the, the uh, probably a little less secure just because all the numbers are a little bit lower. We don't have as much room, uh, for example, to absorb another financial crisis if it were to occur. Three characteristics that I generally use to describe Olin's financial uh, picture. One, we've been highly dependent on a single source of revenue, and that's the endowment. You'll see that that situation is, is improving. We're highly leveraged, and by that I mean that we have a lot of debt uh, out there uh, for the size college we are. And we also have a very high cost structure. Some of that has to do with engineering education, some of it has to do with the small size, uh, but our budget for this year, uh, divided by the number of students, comes out to about $93,000 per student, which is um, very high. What I'm going to do now is show you a series of graphs um, that show some of the historical uh, trends. and. Um, the x-axis on most of them is fiscal year, similar to the uh, uh, fundraising graph that, that Rick showed you. Our fiscal year starts on July 1st and runs through June 30th, so it's similar to an academic year, a little bit longer. Um, pay attention to the trends more than the absolute numbers, uh, and that'll give you the picture. Um, you know, Rick touched on this before. We 
you know, every class tells us they're the best class that's ever been at Olin. You've told us classes before and after you have told us. I mean, the class of 17 has been here for uh, three weeks and two hours, and they're telling us they're the best class. But I think from this data, what I've seen is that there is some correlation between the time the class of 2008 was on campus and the financial strength of the college. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we'll see now. So one um, simple measure of financial strength of an organization is called net assets. Assets are the things you own and um, liabilities are the things you owe. And net assets is the difference between assets and liabilities. Now for Olin, the two big assets that we have are the endowment and the value of the campus. And the largest liability we have is the debt that's outstanding. So the one thing, you know, the, the campus has been the campus all along, the debt has essentially been the same. So the one thing that changed here in 2000, after fiscal year 2008 was the value of the endowment. So, as I said before, we're operating at a lower level than we had been operating. And here is the endowment value. You can see it uh, uh, peaked. Uh, these are fiscal year end values at 482. There was actually one quarter in which we just went over 500 million, uh, but we're significantly lower now. And that you know, we saw this coming. We were, we were living through it in the 2008-2009 uh, period, and that's when we started making some changes to try to be able to survive through this dramatic change. When you look at the endowment per student, that's gone down, but it's still about a million dollars per student. Now, that probably puts us in the top 10 in the country in that metric. Most campuses would kill to have numbers like that. Uh, so, you know, we're still in good shape. You know, 1.6 million per student or 2 million per student is better, but a million per student is not bad. The thing is with us, that is the primary source of revenue. We don't have a huge tuition stream or other sources of revenue that those other institutions have. Now here's the bumpy ride we've seen. The, the endowment returns are what we've realized um, from the investment activity. Um, so, you know, things were going well, and then the bottom fell out, uh, mostly in fiscal year 2009, and then uh, it's been a somewhat bumpy recovery since then. One thing to remember, too, is these percentage gains are before we take money out of the endowment for spending, for running the college. So the net gains are lower each year, and the net losses in those years are larger because we're spending from the endowment. And if you just do a simple arithmetic average, it comes out to about 5.4% on average per year, which is low. And uh, keep that number in mind when we look at the endowment spending rates in a, in a couple of slides. This is a little finer look at the endowment. The blue line shows the value of the endowment at the end of each quarter, every three months. And you can see that, that one quarter where it poked up right around 500 million. The gray line is what we call the 12 quarter trailing average. Each gray data point is the average of the preceding 12 blue points. And we use the 12 quarter trailing average as a smoothing mechanism for determining how much we have to spend in a given year. The red boxes are the December 31st values of the 12 quarter trailing averages, and that's actually what we use to calculate how much money will be available to spend in the following fiscal year. So this December 31st of 2013, whatever that 12 quarter trailing average is, will determine what we can spend in fiscal year 15, a year from now. The trailing average really helped us during this period when, um, you know, things were falling out here because we were still spending off the trailing average even though the actual value of the endowment had dropped significantly. Um, 
So it, it, it's, you know, trailing averages are very helpful when the markets or values are going down. When the markets are going up, you tend to underspend what you could if you just went by the spot values. Now, recently, you can see the lines are pretty much on top of each other, um, and, and that just is another indication of how slow the recovery has been in the endowment. Um, you know, Rick is fond of saying there's a simple solution to fixing this, and it's just get the blue line above the gray line and make sure it's, it's above it every quarter, and eventually things will get better. Um, so those are the instructions we've given to our investment managers. <laughs> we need the blue line higher. <laughs> now, I mentioned before that we, be, we are becoming less dependent on the endowment, and this chart uh, shows that uh, back in 2003, almost 100% of the funding we used to run the college came from the endowment. Now we're down around 60%. Um, still um, quite high compared to most institutions, uh, but other institutions are 60, 70, 80 percent dependent on tuition revenue. Um, so we think this is terrific. This is a great trend uh, and will help keep money in the endowment. Now we can also look at that in dollars and um, see how much money we've taken out of the endowment each year, and that's been coming down as well. Uh, last fiscal year, which ended on June 30th, it was the lowest once again, the lowest amount we've taken from the endowment since the college reached full enrollment. This year's budget is up, but um, generally we end up taking out less during the course of the year than we budgeted, so I would expect the, uh, the final number for the current year to be lower than that $20 million. But to go from you know, $24.5 million in fiscal 08 down to uh, under 18 million now has been a, a great change. Here are the spending rates that I mentioned earlier. Um, we use that 12 quarter trailing average and then we'll come up with a percentage of that value to take for spending. And you can see the, uh, the, sol the darker blue bars are the spending rate that was budgeted. Um, so it's been mid to high fives in the early years. It was over 6%. But every year we've ended up spending less than what we thought we would spend. The light blue bars show the actual numbers. Now, even though our dependence on the endowment has been coming down over the past few years and the dollars we've been taking out of the endowment have come down over the past few years, you notice that the spending rates have gone up, and that's just because we're working with a smaller base we have to take a higher percentage. These are high. You know, a general rule of thumb is that spending rates should not exceed 5% of a 12-quarter trailing average, and a lot of institutions try to go even lower than that, and that's to ensure that the purchasing power of the endowment uh, is, is there in, indefinitely into the future. Uh, although most technical schools, engineering schools, tend to have a higher spending rate just because our cost structure is higher. Uh, Rick showed this slide before. Certainly, uh, the, the, the funds coming in through the efforts of the development team have been critical to helping us uh, replace the, the revenues that have been lost from the endowment. Now, on the liability side, uh, I mentioned before the biggest liability is our outstanding debt. We borrowed money to build the campus. Um, the theory behind it is we can pay less in interest than we can earn by, you know, if we keep the money in, uh, pay less in interest on the debt and leave the money in the, the endowment and earn there. And in general, that has worked, although, uh, as you can see from this chart, it was a bumpy ride there for a while. What, what this shows is it's called the blended rate, or if, if I add everything together, which I do really on a weekly basis, add everything together and calculate what the, the, the weighted average rate is with all fees and everything else, that's what's showing on this chart. And, and to put it in perspective, with about $160 million of debt outstanding, every 1% change in this blended rate is an additional $1.6 million 
of interest that we pay, have to pay in a given year. So you can imagine how unhappy I was back when this rate was poking up over 7%. Luckily, it didn't stay there long. And, and more recently, uh, we've benefited from the low interest rates that uh, uh, have been out there in the short-term markets and had a relatively low and stable blended rate. Rick, what did you, Rick used to call this, you know, like my, my EKG chart or something, you know, <laughs> things going wild during the crisis. <laughs> So this is good news that the rates are down. In the past year, we did a major restructuring of the debt portfolio. We were able to reduce the amount of debt outstanding. We were able to refinance part of it at a much lower rate. And we took some of those savings and used it to convert variable rate debt to fixed rate debt, which in the short term costs us a little more. So you can see that little bump on the right-hand side of the graph. But in the long term, it will reduce some of the volatility that we see in this chart. Now, Rick touched on the need-based financial aid before, too. Uh, this is a, a critical component for us, and we knew that we were going to need to um, uh, increase the amount of money that we were allocating for need-based aid. Um, so what this chart shows are, are the uh, four classes that are here on campus now, and as um, those that are paying um, 50 percent tuition. So as expected, the number of students in each class who became eligible for need-based aid uh, went up uh, significantly. It was probably in the 10 to 12 percent range before this. Um, you know, and it's been high. The numbers are so small that a few students one way or another move the percentages around, but it's, it's a fair number of students who are receiving need-based aid. Now, this, this chart shows a couple of things. Let's, let's look at the gray bars first. What that is is of those students in the freshman class who receive need-based aid, we look at FY14, the average grants that those students get is the $20,539. Okay, so those are need-based grants, average of just those receiving need-based aid. The blue bar is for all entering students the average value of all the grants that they're giving. That's the merit and the need-based aid averaged out over the entire incoming class. Another way to look at this is what's called the discount rate. And it's really when you, uh, th th there's a accepted calculation which is um, the total institutional financial aid that's given to students, and that can be either merit or need-based, divided by tuition and required fees. And when we do that for our, our incoming classes, we're you know, mid-60s to high 60s percent. To put that in perspective, the national average uh, Nakubo is an organization that does a study of this each year. The national average is 46 percent. So probably not surprising to you, our total financial aid packages are much higher than, than most institutions. Um, you know, the, the average has been creeping up over the years as more and more schools are, are trying to provide more financial aid to students. So what, what's all this, what has all this meant? A um, few things. One, diversifying the revenue streams has been critical and also enhancing uh, the revenue streams. So the increase in the fundraising efforts, we've been putting many more resources into that and the results have, have, have been there. Uh, we're looking at other activities um, to raise money uh, from, you know, it's the soccer fields are in use constantly, and some of it are by our mm -hmm. athletic activities that you heard about this morning, but often it's, it's outside groups that are paying us to use the, uh, the uh, fields. During the summer, the campus is packed. The residence halls are full because we're renting out the space to outside camps who are, who are operating here. And some of our 
partnership programs with other institutions we're looking to as potential revenue sources in the future. And then just over a year ago, we made the decision to change the managers of our endowment. We weren't happy with the results we were getting from the previous managers. We made a change, and at least in their first year, it appears the results were good. On the expense side, the top priority for us continues to be the academic and the student life programs. If it's ever a question of resource allocation, those two areas are always at the top of the list. And right there with them is the need-based aid program. That's, that's very important to us. We want to stay need-blind and meet essentially full need with grants for as long as we possibly can. I mentioned the restructuring of the debt before. And what we've done and what we continue to do is when there are needs for new money, we first look at reallocating money from within one part of the college's budget to another part instead of just constantly increasing the budget and thereby drawing more out of the endowment. And that's worked pretty well. If you're really interested in all this data, a lot of it is posted and more is posted on the college's website under the Financial Affairs Office, uh, on the Financial Affairs Office pages. So uh, we're pretty transparent. There's all the financial statements, historical budgets are out there if, you, if you're interested. So looking forward, you know, the endowment is recovering, but boy, it's a slow, slow process uh, and um, probably will be for a while. Despite that, we continue to make new investments. Uh, we've added uh, six faculty lines to the budget. Uh, some are already in place and some are planned for the future. You know, it's critical that we, we expand the faculty. Uh, the expanded fundraising efforts that Rick spoke about really aimed at our two primary missions. One, improving the quality of the academic or the educational experience on campus, and then the second, is helping us expand our influence around the world. Need-based aid, say it again, we're committed to that. And then, as Rick mentioned earlier too, the long-term capital renewal and replacement reserves. You know, we've been living this charmed life of having a brand new campus and not a lot of maintenance, but already we're starting to see things have to be replaced and repaired, and the, the rate of that is only going to increase. And that's it. Uh, I'll do a quick question, and we're, we're going to take all the questions at the end. But go, go ahead. I was wondering if, uh, you do the comparison of the discount rate for fiscal year 2010 before we switched from full tuition to half tuition. So if you were 60 percent roughly with the half tuition, what would the discount rate have been? Uh, obviously, much higher. Um, so high that whenever that Nakubo organization called me and said, you know, we want you to participate in the tuition discounting survey, I said, no, you don't. Uh, <laughs> I said, you know, that, it, our numbers are just absurd for what you're trying to look at, and they would skew, you know, one school isn't going to skew the results that much, but uh, we do participate now, more a little bit down, but it was um, probably in the 90s. We, we'll come back for questions at the end, if that's okay, and, and I'll turn it over to Vin at this point. So I have an extensive PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> so if you can see, the first part is about people, and the second part is about activities, and the third part is about themes and what's going on. And uh, my slide about scope that Rick stole is right about there. <laughs> um, so I'm going to get rid of my glasses. This way I can see you, because the focal length is wrong. Often, I'm talking to people in this auditorium, leave my glasses on, and I say, and uh, Andrew knows, and where's Andrew? Oh, gosh, he's right over here. Well, I don't know everybody's name, and I apologize for that, and hopefully we can all fix that uh, together. Uh, for those who, who I haven't met, I'm Vin Mano. I've been here at Olin since July of 2011. On most days, it feels like I uh, just arrived. On other days, it feels like 
100 years. Um, but it's uh, really been a wonderful transition for me. Since you don't, a number of you don't know me that well, I'll give you the one minute bio. Um, I uh, professionally, before I came to Olin, I was at down the road at Tufts University uh, for 27 years. Um, and I loved Tufts, still love Tufts. But um, the opportunity to come and join this community of students, faculty, staff, and alumni was just too good uh, to, to, to not take advantage of because of not only the people, but the important project that, that Olin is. Um, I have uh, married. My wife is a physician. We have three kids all about your age, one older to a little younger. Uh, my daughter, the oldest, will be getting married in three weeks. And so while I'm very happy, Chrissy, that you have good weather today, I've been praying for one rainy weekend after another until October 12th, because if the weather isn't good, somehow I'm going to be blamed. So, uh, so just keep your fingers crossed for me. Um, people and are, are, uh, are really what uh, reunions and, and gatherings like this are about. So I thought I'd uh, mention some comings and goings that probably that have happened since you folks were here. Um, and that's usually, you know, my own experience with alumni events, um, the biggest shock and say, well, so-and-so isn't here or who the heck is, is, is that? Because when we leave an institution, it sort of gets fixed in time and as what we, what we expect. So I'll just mention a few, and I'm sure there'll be others, and, and we, can, we can chat about them. Among the faculty, a number of new faculty have arrived, and hopefully between this event and other events, you will get to know them. I'm not gonna go through a roster of the folks that we have added, but in a minute or two, I'll talk a little bit about faculty recruiting more from a thematic perspective. Um, there have been some departures of people that you probably did know. Um, Mark Chang was on the faculty here. Uh, last year, Mark was on a personal leave. He had been, invited, had been invited to work at edX, the MIT Harvard uh, MOOC collaborative, uh, to be something that is, was called the director of product. As I understand it, it was the person who actually had to deliver on the vision uh, of, of how the uh, courses would actually roll out. Mark spent about a year at edX and uh, came, it was supposed to be a two year leave, um, came and had a chat with me this past summer and said that he and Corinne and their kids uh, had decided to move to Seattle. Um, and it was much more of a personal than a professional decision. They have family out there and it was just sort of all working uh, better for, for, from an overall perspective. Uh, I know uh, Mark said, uh, anytime, Olin, if you want to move to Seattle, that would be great uh, because I will be happy to come right back on the faculty. Um, Osger Eris, who I think was here when, when you folks were, had spent uh, a couple of, a year or so at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands in their design group, which is one, really one of the top ranked design uh, uh, de academic departments in the world um, and uh, found that that environment was one with a lot of, after a lot of soul searching that, that he uh, was more comfortable in as far as his own professional development was concerned. So he left last year. Um, just this past August, Dave Anderson, who I think everybody spent a lot of time with in the fabrication facilities, um, as Dave described it to me, he, when he arrived at Olin um, yeah, and spoke to Dave Kearns and others, he said, well, this looked like an interesting six-month six gig uh, that went on for over a decade. Um, and Dave, um, as you all know, is a really talented and creative guy. And over the years, has bu was building up his own independent uh, engineering design and uh, fabrication consulting practice. And now it's just become so successful that um, that's what he's going to be devoting uh, all of his time to. Um, uh, Terry Dunphy, who you may have uh, remembered, who, who was actually my right-hand person when I arrived here 
couple of years ago. Uh, similar to, to Tom's situation, uh, decided that being a grandmother was much more interesting and exciting than working for Vin Mano, and um, uh, decided to do that. Uh, and finally, Rod Crafts. Can you believe that? Uh, none of us really can, um, that, that, that Rod uh, is now up in Maine watching whatever the indigenous bird species are uh, there. Um, and right after commencement, um, uh, we thought we saw Rod pull out of the driveway and, and move on. But um, I'm really excited to the, um, to the addition to the community that we have had. The, the new Dean of Student Life is um, a person named Rayanne Butera. Uh, Rayanne, her, her last um, position, she was the Associate Dean of Student Life and Director of First Year Programs at Smith College. Um, and she had been there for a while, and similar to my own personal experience, um, Rayanne moved because of what a great opportunity it was to be part of the Olin community. So now she's moved into the house right at the corner uh, with her husband and their two little kids. Um, so uh, the number of babysitting possibilities have increased among, among the faculty, and you'll get to know Rayanne over the, over, the, over, the, over the years, but Rod not being here is quite dramatic. Um, there have been other changes, uh, but a lot, of, a lot of people are still here, thank goodness, the real heart and soul of the institution. Uh, some of them are here in the audience uh, today. One of the things that I did when I came in um, and got to know Olin and the Olin curriculum programs and aspirations um, was realized that I needed a lot of help. Uh, from my colleagues, from the students, from everyone to, 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 to help move in the directions that we were all interested in. And lucky for me, there are a number of people on the faculty that you already know um, that were just so talented and so insightful and so dedicated to Olin that I asked them to be some of my primary colleagues. Uh, so I created three associate dean positions. Um, this is not an administrative structure. I wasn't looking to be the boss of more people. Um, the underlying uh, structure of the Olin academic situation is that all the faculty re reports to me. That's about 40 or 45 people. So all of you that you know study management, um, when you if you look at that, it sort of violates every principle uh, that there is as far as what a reporting structure should be. But it works because it's Olin. Um, but it was more to have a group of people that could work together as a team uh, to move along various dimensions. And two of the three folks are here. Mark, I think you all know Mark Somerville. Mark's uh, title changed from, uh, yeah, give Mark a round of applause. Um, Mark's title is now Associate Dean for Faculty Affairs and Development. It was Faculty Affairs and Research. Um, but the name change was significant, and I'll come back to that, that, that just as student development is important at Olin, because student development at Olin is somewhat different than other institutions, what it means to be a faculty member at Olin is different than it is at other institutions. And it's not just a playbook that you can take out of the library and figure out the right thing to do. Uh, sitting way over in the corner is Jessica Townsend, so let's applaud for Jessica. So Jessica made a big mistake. Um, she went on leave the year before I came. And um, when I, as I came to Olin, I knew that we really were at the point where we should think about taking a next major steps in the curricular area. And I kept hearing all these good things about this person, Jessica Townsend, who was in Seattle. And I also knew that our friendly accreditors from ABET were going to be coming back next year. Um, so I think she may have been still jet lagged, but she so I walked into my office from Seattle and I said, how would you like to be associate dean for uh, curricula, curriculum and academic, 
what is it, Jessica? Curriculum and academic programs? Yep. And, and bleary-eyed, she said yes. Um, and, and Jessica's uh, just been, uh, f f done a fabulous job there. Lynn Stein, who you all know who's not here because she asked, and I said, no, you could take the day off. Uh, it's Saturday. Um, and L Lynn has been really both the thought leader and the organizational leader in Olin's initial efforts to co-create and catalyze a change in engineering education uh, in the country and throughout the world. Um, I had, we created a, an associate dean's title for her to focus in these areas, and more recently with the um, unveiling of the collaboratory, her title is now going to be associate dean and director of the collaboratory. The important, and I'll come back, there are, so it's three in Minnesota, they're pseudo-administrative positions, but they're more thematic positions. Um, the other unbelievable thing about all these folks is that, lo and behold, um, what was 100% of what they did, instead of taking 30 or 40 or 50 percent, they've just starting to do 180 uh, percent all the time, uh, teaching, doing their own intellectual vitality work, and doing all this other good work that, that I describe. Which leads me out of the people portion of the presentation to what's going on. Um, and before I talk about some specific things, I think what's important, you know, when people describe Olin academically, uh, or in the press, uh, if they're thinking about the academic programs, the two things that they say usually in the same breath, especially in academic circles, are no departments, no tenure. A lot of times these days they say no tenure first because um, tenure is implied in the press as, well, if you have tenure, then you have ossification and, 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 and people just sitting around their offices, uh, it's, it's, et cetera, and that's not true. But in my mind, I tell people, well, if you're going to make a slide about Olin, you put no tenure in a six-point font about this big at the bottom of the page, and you put no departments in a 20-point font at the top of the page. Because the faculty attitude towards the curriculum and towards each other is very much that of a coherent whole, as opposed to just a set of individual departments doing their own things with all independent and usually uh, counterproductive separate effects. And that really um, characterizes what goes on around here. So what does go on around here? I'm just going to rewind the tape to, to last year and then through the summer and then talk about some themes and then we can have Q&A. And the great thing I have, uh, great thing I have, have having Mark and Jessica and, and when Lynn is here is that um, I can do this because all the stuff that I forget they're here and they'll say, no, of course, that's not right. Um, but so last year, ABIT did come. Um, and we just found out in July, we received a full reaccreditation of all our three programs. So that's an achievement in itself. But how we went about it, I think, is even more important that I wanted to share with you. Um, first of all, um, we went to ABET and said, you know, we've got three degree programs. But if you really want to know the truth, we can send you one report. Um, and some of, those, some of the sections of the reports will have three subsections, it's a ME, ECE, E, but the overlap is so great. Well, ABET being super innovative said, no, we want three reports. Um, so, we set, so as Jessica's pointed out, we wrote, three, we, th we wrote our one report and then just printed it out three times uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, and had, a, have those, had those few sections in that we did. The one thing that they wanted me to do was to separate the faculty into tribes. Uh, you know, we wanted the ME tribe and the ECE tribe and that tribe. And I said, I'm not doing it. Each report will have the same appendix with the same set of faculty. You figure it out when you get here. Um, the second thing that we did is that we knew ABET um, had actually some of the, 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 the spirit of what ABET is trying to do in their credentialing process is actually very good. Uh, but they still get stuck on words. Uh, and they looked at our, uh, our educational objectives, and they didn't like the tense of a couple of verbs. Um, so we had a choice, and Jessica and I do, knew this in the year before they came. We had two choices. One is we could just sit there and change the tense of about three verbs, and they wouldn't have any problem. 
But we said, we're in the middle of strategic planning. We are just not going to futz around with the words. Um, we want to go through this process of trying to develop a set of educational objectives that are appropriate for the institution. It will probably change, but we're doing it on our time schedule. It will be done by the time you leave, but it's not going to be done before you come because we have a process to go through. So we basically knew that the train was coming down the track was going to hit us. Um, so ABET came, they had all sorts of good things to say, and then they handed us our on exit their reports and say, and they said, well, you know, you're probably not going to get fully accredited because those verbs still are, in, are still wrong. But we said, that's fine. Uh, we go, we're going through our process, and before you have to write your final reports, we will have this done. And we did have this done, and we developed, with your help, um, a set of objectives that work for us. It got into their final reports. Uh, so last July, they all raised their hands. The one thing they did say in our report, they have a concern, and a concern is not an uh, actionable thing. The same concern we have. We have so much work going on, especially in the project area, that they're saying you've got a space problem as far as doing project work is concerned. So all we could say to that, our response was amen, and we went on. Uh, uh, we, we, went on uh, we went on from that. So how we went about ABET was important. Uh, Rick mentioned about scope. Uh, Drew Bennett had done a great job as, as director, but we see scope as something that's not owned by one or two faculty members. That is really faculty engagement and development opportunities. So now Alicia Sarang Siminski has taken over uh, the scope program, and it's, it's, it's uh, better and better each year, not only in the sponsorship, but in the academic integrity of how scope fits in uh, to to the program. There are some initiatives that you probably know about in the mathematics area of changing the mathematics curriculum. There's a new mathematics sequence, linearity one and two. We spent some strategic time figuring out how to improve the impact of writing across the curriculum. Um, something else we worked on was to lay the seeds of taking a, a fundamental look of how entrepreneurship is embedded into the Olin education model. And that's something that I'll pick up in the last part of the presentation right here, which is about themes. Um, but let me tell you to lead into that of what went on last summer around here, since you weren't here. Um, there are, as the dorms were fill, filled with camps, with other people, but with a lot of Olin students, 65 or 70 Olin students were here working on projects and programs. Some of those were part of, a, of an NSF-funded grant called Research Experiences for Undergraduates and Research Experience for Teachers. What's amazing about this is that they weren't here as individuals. We had students from other universities coming here for that. NSF gives those grants to Research One institutions because that's too uh, signify that this is a place where research in this area is among the best and that students from other schools should be exposed to it as undergraduates. Olin College received one of those grants through the good work of a number of faculty members such as Debbie Chatra and Zhenya Zestevka, who has designated a place where when it comes to engineering education research, this is the place to come and learn about that. And I thought that was really significant. Um, other things going on that summer with a number of faculty involved with curricular revision and innovation uh, and on a more systemic level. And that will lead me to the, the four themes that we're following this year, and, and that's where I'll bring us to the close. Uh, one is curricular revision and innovation. I, so I'm sure I'm going to get questions or we'll, we'll get questions as to what this might be and what this might feel like. At the moment, we're really at the point is what should be the, how should we go about doing this? Um, curricular innovation is easier to do when a school is just being formed, you know, as before the boat is sailing. Uh, and now how do you do it while well, the boat's sailing without sinking the boat? Um, that's an important question. Uh, but we know that entrepreneurship is, is, is embedded in that theme. We know a better integration of math, science, and engineering is in, is in, is, is in, that, in that theme and a number of other areas. Um, the second is in the area of faculty development where Mark has spent a great deal of his attention. Uh, what it means to be an Olin faculty member is different than what it means to be a faculty member in a Research One institution. But at the same time, you need to have both achievement and challenge 
that is appropriate. And what we're trying to, f what we're trying to do is develop a rubric of developing faculty, giving them a chance to develop, but at the same time, assessing them against their impact, both their impact on the institution and their impact outside of the, of the institution. I think this is going to be relevant not only for Olin faculty, but if you follow what's going on in the press and academics, the old models of how faculty are assessed are going to die, and we may, I am convinced we're working on the new models. The third of our four themes is in the area of, we have student life and academic affairs, which are, with the, with the, with the, with the learning continuum, are related, but we really have the goal, with a new dean coming in, of really stepping back and taking a look at how do we turn academic affairs and student life into academic life, into much more of a continuum. So that's the third theme. And the fourth is the level of work and external engagements and collaboration has really exploded since you've been on this campus. The amount of traffic that we receive, the amount of sub substantive exercises that we're involved with, places like the University of Illinois, where I'm going to be on Monday, University of Texas at El Paso, uh, a school in Brazil named INSPER, several other schools both outside the United States and within the United States, Purdue School of Technology, where, uh, where it's not only, it's not only providing consulting services, it's us creating with them, learning from them. Um, and if I just link this back for a second to the faculty piece, how do we attract the type of faculty that we want at Olin? Well, innovation is always going to be part of Olin, but certainly we can't say what the first faculty had. You're going to be able to build a school from the ground up. But if you could be part of a school where you're both doing the internal work and you could be involved with other people building programs from the ground up, uh, that's, sort of, that's, that's a very attractive second best. So with that, I'll stop and take any questions. I will all take any questions. Anybody still awake? Oh. Anybody still awake? Yeah, Mina. Okay, so for the uh, recording, let me repeat the question, uh, which I think is, my interpretation is, what's happened to the math curriculum since 2008? Yeah, so I, I mean, you guys know that, um, there, I mean, there are a couple of things that were going on when you were here with the math curriculum. One was that we had all these two credit math courses, right? So there was like linear algebra and there was vector calculus and there's differential equations and there was prob stat. Um, and there were a variety of reasons why those were there, but I think over time, one of the things that um, both students realized through experience and faculty realized through experience is that those little chunks didn't work terribly well. Uh, so that was, I think, one challenge in math. Um, frankly, another challenge in math that, that we faced is a, is a staffing challenge, and so we've made some, made some additional hires in the mathematics space as well. But um, as the faculty began to, both as we added capacity in the faculty space for mathematics, but also as the faculty began to reflect on, okay, these, these little two-credit chunks don't work, there was a lot of thinking about how can we actually make the mathematics experience better integrated, both with other disciplines and within the discipline of mathematics. Uh, and so one of the, th the, the sort of sequence right now that is, is laid out, and, and Sarah Adams and John Geddes are sort of the main sort of architects who started this, and then some of the new faculty, Aaron Hoffman and Aaron Byrne, have been very involved in creating this as well. And I will, I will note that this is an, a work in progress. Like if you talk to current students, they will tell you this is a work in progress. It is not done. But the current structure is that in the first semester, there's a class called ModSim, which is partially math and partially science and partially computation that sort of introduces ideas in differential equations and numerics, basically. Then in the second semester, there's a class that's Linearity 1, which combines linear algebra 
with differential equations and that sort of builds on some of the numerical method stuff in the first semester and complements it with more analytical approaches in the, in the second semester. Um, and that, yeah, right, so linearity one, the first time when it was originally being proposed, the idea was that it, would, it was going to be an intradisciplinary course that included differential equations, vector calculus, and linear algebra. And if you write DE, VC, LA, and you kind of squint, you get death claw. Or maybe if you're Sarah Adams and you squint, you get death claw. Um, so, th so there was this idea that the first course would have all three of those subjects, and it became very clear that although Death Claw was a really sticky name, and the, the first iteration, like the website, had this horrible drawing of a <laughs> claw on it, that in fact it, it didn't make sense to try to include the vector calculus in that sort of first experience. Uh, the second um, experience, Linearity 2, is one that builds on that, and both both moves a little bit in the direction of starting to think about partial differential equations, adding sort of vector calculus into the mix, and also adding sort of becoming more nonlinear in the types of equations that are dealt with. But it's much more of an integrated experience where there is sort of one sequence of math experiences that, that everyone is going through in the same order at the same time. So everyone is taking linearity one in their, first sem in their second semester of freshman year. Everyone is taking linearity two in the first semester of their sophomore year. It's being taught in a studio type of setting. So the idea is that um, there's some amount of time when there's the instructors sort of talking about stuff and presenting things, but a lot of collaborative um, problem solving in class and a lot of students actually presenting the, the work that they're doing and being taught in more of a coordinated way where everyone, all of the math faculty is involved in in creating that. So, I, I mean, certainly it is moving in a really positive direction. Um, you know, honestly, that, that part of the curriculum, like, we could do anything and it would have been better, right? Uh, um, but it's actually, it's getting a lot better. Um, and it, but it is still a very much a work in progress. I think there's, there's still a lot, there's been, the, we ran the second iteration of Linearity 1 this last um, spring, and we're running the second iteration of Linearity 2 right now, and I, I expect, based on previous experience, by iteration three or iteration four is when it um, might start to look like something that everyone's like, yeah, that's one of those things we've always done at Olin, and it's really great. <laughs> but we're not quite, we're not there yet, but we're definitely getting there. If I understand the question correctly, it's about using alumni as faculty. So, Vin? It's been a huge success. Uh, um, the, so, uh, this year, on the full-time faculty as a visitor, we have Juliana bernal Astos. Uh, we've had a number of, uh, faculty, uh, of alumni who uh, have been helping us out year after year. Uh, uh, and uh, and this year, uh, Guy joined us from Artisans Asylum and is co-teaching some courses. Eric Van Weck was with us last year and is back again uh, this year. Uh, I'm sure, Olin, we will approach, we may be approaching that time as you people uh, progress that uh, there'll be more and more Olin people on the full-time faculty. and. Uh, Last year's, I think as you know, last year's graduating class was so taken with the good experiences they had from Olin alumni and alumnae uh, joining the faculty as adjuncts or at least in part-time roles that their class gift was to provide different opportunities, short courses and the like where that alumni could get involved with. So it's something that we just think this year, the number is large of all and alumni involved in the program, and it's been nothing but a positive thing. I don't, did I answer the question that? Oh, okay, so the question is that um, related to the amount of time that faculty could spend with students as far as the faculty numbers are concerned. Um, 
I mean, to be perfectly honest, the expansion of the faculty, which has actually been a very slow uh, process, especially if you think about the comings and goings that, that, I, that I described, um, to a certain extent, um, I guess if there are more faculty, the interaction times would be, will be greater. Um, from my perspective, um, the Olin faculty, new and existing folks who are here, are extraordinarily engaged um, with, with, the, with the students. There is a very much an open door, an open access uh, policy. Uh, so that's something that we will always set as an expectation for the faculty, but to be perfectly honest, the faculty expansion is really to give us increased capacity to take on curricular innovation, both internally and externally. That's really what the focus is. Maybe I can just clarify a little bit. If you were interested in fluid mechanics, and you were here in 2008, and we had, you know, Brian's story, and that was it, and if we go forward, we have three Brian stories on the faculty. Even if they don't spend any higher percentage of their time talking to students than Brian did, you as a student have three times as many opportunities to talk to a faculty member that has fluid mechanics as an interest. Even though we're not hiring them just for that purpose, I think an expansion of the faculty will have a lot of benefits for the students. Boy. <laughs> That's a question for the Guinness Book, I think. <laughs> Other questions? We're running out of questions? Yeah. Okay, first Simone and then Nick. Yeah. Well, let's see. <laughs> Okay, so if I understand this correctly, Olin has announced its plan to play a role in leading a revolution in engineering education outside of our campus. What kind of support is the college planning to develop in order to make that happen in addition to the faculty? I mean, we've talked about adding faculty, but what else, right? Um, that's a very good question, and this has a lot to do with this thing that we're calling the collaboratory. Now, I think when you graduated in 2008, we didn't even have the predecessor to the collaboratory yet, which is what we called I2E2, um, which is appropriately confusing. It's a little bit like R2D2. Um, I2E2 stood for the Initiative for Innovation in Engineering Education, and it was our outreach arm. So what's happened is Olin has gotten an increasing amount of press, and as a result, with no amount of advertising or push from Olin, people show up on our doorstep and they want to see what's happening. So in the last three years or so, three and a half years, I think we've had about 250 different organizations that have come through here, which is a bit of a burden because we don't have that many people to continually host visits. If they come back a second time and they say, we would like to, um, actually take notes this time. We'd like to watch a class. We, we would like to talk to Mark Somerville or somebody about the change in the curriculum. Uh, this becomes a real burden. So we herded them into the summer and created a summer institute. And this is a program which has now had about 220 faculty members go through it from around the world. And what does go through it mean? Basically what that amounts to is that there is a week, week or two weeks of workshops in which faculty come from other places, usually in pairs, but maybe more. They have an idea about change on their own campus. Uh, they have green lights from their administration that says, we care about this and we'd be willing to help you if you come back with good ideas. They spend time here uh, working with like-minded people from other parts of the world to develop new approaches to education within their own environment and then they go back and they try and implement it. Sometimes that's not enough. 
okay? They came back with nine people from the National University of Singapore and wanted to spend a week. The dean was here taking notes. Um, they went home and they created uh, something called the Design-Centric Curriculum, which is a new approach to education in Singapore. Um, there are others for which even that isn't enough, and we now send teams of Olin faculty members to their campus at times when they're, you know, between, it's during semester break or fall break or spring break, and they'll spend a week on their campus giving a workshop. So this is becoming sort of an industry for Olin. Um, and so there's been some staff growth in this program. Uh, we have a new person, Sharon Breitbart, who I don't think was here in 2008, um, who helps support Lynn in this. And in the typical Olin fashion, we don't have an office down there three blocks away with, you know, their own marketing unit. It's the faculty that does this as a group. And they do this by spending a fraction of their time rather than having a few people that spend 100% of their time doing it, which wouldn't work anyway. Um, if we do this well, we're hoping that we will develop um, a group of universities that are committed on a, to work together uh, as an organization. The, maybe just one more story, because this could take a long time to tell you all the, things, all the things that are going on. Maybe we can talk privately. Um, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign is probably the best example of what can happen and how this is scaffolded with other people's resources. Um, University of Illinois came to us about 2009, I think, was interested in changing their education, wanted to know if they could learn some things from us. That year, there were some exchanges of faculty from both sides. Some students even came to see what's going on. The next year, some pilot courses were begun on the Illinois campus. The year after that, the pilot courses grew, and they had a large fraction of students interested in them. Today, um, all 1,500 incoming freshmen at the University of Illinois are taking a program which was co-designed between Olin and Illinois. Uh, in fact, this is not the first year, and it's like the second year. Um, Vin is going to Illinois next week because the Dean of Engineering at the time uh, this was created, has now been promoted to become the provost of the university as a whole, and he's now interested in exploring these kinds of ideas, things like like intrinsic motivation, design-centered learning, um, student engagement on a large level for all courses at Illinois, not just engineering. Uh, we don't know what that means yet. We don't know what role Olin can play. Olin is, you know, not that big. So Olin can help think about things, but we probably can't take on the goal of actually making them happen on a large level. Our friends um, at Illinois have also taken on other roles. The person that we work probably most closely with at Illinois was a guy named David Goldberg, who um, took early retirement from Illinois, I think in large part because of the experience he had in working with us. He's now become a consultant. He, he travels the world um, giving seminars about, uh, I think he, he calls the missing basics and uh, transformation of engineering education. You can find it on the web. There's this um, website called The Big Beacon, and uh, there's a manifesto for the need for change, and it's growing. We are adding uh, people from foundations and from the venture capital world. Uh, there was a book last year written by a fellow at Harvard named Tony Wagner uh, called Creating Innovators, the Making of Young People Who Will Change the World. Tony is a good friend of Olin uh, in his book. Uh, he has a 23-page section on Olin, which is longer than any other institution uh, involved. So we're not exactly sure, and we don't have an org chart with a, a plant in, in Michigan that makes cars that's going to be relabeled Olin College. Um, it's not about that. It's about working with others to collaborate in order to uh, create change. So I'm not sure if that answers your question at all, um, but I'd be glad to talk with you more later. And I would encourage you to talk to Lynn Stein, who spent a lot of time worrying about this. Okay? Um, Nick, do you still remember your question? <laughs> How will entrepreneurship develop at Olin? Yeah, in the, in the curriculum and in the next year. 
in the curriculum and student life and in, throughout the institution. Yeah. So this is sort of like the math story except two chapters before as far as the timing, uh, the timing is concerned. But it's a great question because it's one that certainly, I guess, again, from my perspective as a newbie coming uh, to Olin and, and fundamentally believing that entrepreneurship or at least entrepreneurial thinking has to be an integral part of engineering undergraduate education to take a look at what, how Olin implemented it. Um, what we did last summer is a small group, I asked a small group of folks uh, to get together um, and basically take a blank sheet of paper um, and say, let's just step back uh, from, where, from where we were. Because I think, um, and you, you folks, I'd be very interested in your individual experiences, a great deal of the Olin entrepreneurship curriculum was really built on the creativity of a couple of faculty members who were really important and wise about this, John Bourne and Steve Schiffman. Uh, but one of the aspects of that, which, was, which is very different about the rest of the Olin curriculum, one of the things that's striking about the Olin curriculum is the fact, again, is the integration of the different pieces, not only in terms of, of, of courses and process and content, but also in faculty. So you'll, you'll get a course like Design Nature, uh, where clearly there are design-centric faculty involved with a course like this, but then there'll be other faculty who certainly that wasn't their primary field, but they realized the importance to the overall curriculum. Entrepreneurship developed almost as a silo uh, in, 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 that, in that regard. So the opportunity with John Bourne retiring and Steve taking emeritus status was to step, to step back. Lawrence Neely, who you may or may not know, who joined after you folks, I think, may have been a visitor here. Was Lawrence a visitor when you were? No. One year, I think, after you, was, he was a visitor and then joined the full-time faculty a couple of, couple of years ago. Um, uh, Jessica was on that committee, Steve Schiffman. Um, and it was, they, I think they've set some general directions that we're starting to implement now. Among them was the fact that entrepreneurship was disconnected. Um, that it needed to be better integrated. And also some more fundamental thought of, again, what should the position of something like entrepreneurship be in an engineering curriculum where it's not an end to itself, it's almost an embedded competency? Um, one, at, at, at 20,000 feet, one general idea is that entrepreneurship should be weaved through the curriculum in a similar way that design is weaved through the curriculum and then connect it to other piece, pieces, not only the design piece, but when you finally get to scope or whatever the capstone experience it is. Lawrence has completely redone what was, I guess, FIBI in your day, uh, became the entrepreneurial initiative, but everybody calls it FIBI anyway. Um, and uh, now uh, he's redone it with this idea of what he, would, what he sees as an initial set of experiences. But beyond that, we also are attracting, we're in the middle of trying to search for faculty in that area, and we've done this for a while, and now we're searching in a different way. We're not sort of taking on sort of an academic search, it's a much broader search, people from non-academic backgrounds, from practice-oriented backgrounds, not only for full-time faculty, but to fill that out with practitioners, uh, both as, as advisors within the courses and outside the courses for things like the foundry um, et, et cetera. So we're at the building phase uh, right now, and I'd love to talk more about it. But that's the general the, the general trend, and we anticipate that there'll be other curricular components after. So we're through iteration. We're in the midst of iteration one on the introductory course. A lot of it is influenced by a course that um, Lawrence has developed called Real Products, Real Markets, um, and then we'll look at what the downstream curricular. Uh, components are. And adding again, the horsepower is to add um, faculty both at the full-time and part-time level who will bring their creativity to it rather than say, here's the blueprint, go build this. Uh, we want the people who will do the blueprint. I don't know. Uh, Jess, do you want to add anything to that? You know, FIBI often happens more in the second year in the second semester, so we're talking about um, sort of this weaving or infusion of entrepreneurial thinking 
into the curriculum, but thinking about how to do it earlier sometime in the first year. So that's, you know, there's some kind of ideas floating out there, but nothing specific yet. But we're, you know, Lawrence is really, he spent the summer looking at several different iterations of what FIBI could be and is in the midst of teaching sort of the first iteration of it. I mean, like linearity and other things, it'll, it'll grow and change. Um, but that could give us a lot of lessons learned for, do, you know, do we want to push that more into the first year, even in the first semester? And how do we create this infusion across the whole four years, but also then a really focused opportunity for those students who are, you know, I mean, we've got a number of seniors now who are having some success in, in some good areas, technical machine and some of the other ones. And so making sure that there are opportunities then to go deep, um, especially in the senior year and the capstone and um, both the ADE, uh, which is sort of an alternate scope and uh, entrepreneurship capstone. So yeah, I'm, I would say if you asked us this question in a year, we'd have probably a lot of exciting things pilot studies to report, or uh, uh, experiments at least. So this is a question about the um, full tuition scholarship and what it will take to return it. Um, so this is explained in some depth in that uh, paper. I really refer you to read that because it, there's a lot of nuances there that are important. But in short, uh, it's about money. If you're going to try to return that amount of, of uh, financial aid, uh, merit-based aid, you can't do it without you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. It's sort of the bottom line. Uh, we think that the when the endowment gets to the level of 550 to 600 million dollars again, we'll have a real, I mean, if it happened like tomorrow and we didn't incre incrementally grow to that level over 50 years and find ways to spend money along the way that we hadn't thought about yet, um, we could commit it to that purpose. That would be cool. Uh, maybe we'll find someone who really cares. Maybe one of you one day will win the lottery and decide that's what you want to do with this. Um, so that's possible. Um, short of that, I think we're going to have to get there in, um, by, by investments from people from outside of our community who really care about the mission that the school is committed to. Uh, what can you do? Uh, number one, do everything you can to uh, become a force for change and innovation wherever you are. Uh, just do what you do well. Uh, make a positive difference in the world. People will notice. They're already noticing you. That will draw attention to the mission of the school. That will help us to have a conversation with people who care about what you're doing to help make an investment in the school. To the extent that you're capable of uh, making a donation, almost everybody here already is, uh, that's helpful, not just because of the dollars, but because it sends a message that you who know us well are uh, invested in us and, and that you care. In fact, one of the things that I think you could do today that would make an impact, Joe has mentioned that he's going to videotape down in the library. If you haven't made a decision yet whether you're going to do that, think about doing it, okay? In addition to the question that he has asked, which is simply, you know, so what have you been up to lately? Um, I, I think you could add to that, what difference did Olin make in your life? Why do you keep coming back here? Um, does, why Olin matters to you? Um, just in your own words, I think that is a powerful story. And telling stories right now is a really important part of getting people on our team. Nobody can tell the story the way you can because you're the people who invested your life in this place to come. Uh, so that's a really important part of what you can do. You know, I can't honestly tell you um, the date that Olin will be able to offer full tuition scholarships again. I can't honestly tell you if Olin we will be able to do that because it isn't gonna happen soon, I don't believe, and um, the amount of money that's required to do that is not small. Um, it's in our founding precepts, 
It's the vision of the Olin Foundation to reward merit. Uh, the half tuition scholarship is what we can do now. Uh, it's still extraordinary um, compared to every other school that we know. Um, so I think working together on this is the best we can do. Okay, thanks for the question. Any, any other questions? Somebody must be hungry by now. There must be a signal. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much.